Yep, let me know when to roll. I have a question. There's the chat area. Is somebody yes. going to manage that? I will manage it. Okay. Yeah. And we are going to start in. Yes, Dr. Pat, we are live now. Okay. Hello, everybody, and welcome to our uh, what is our speakers series class. And we have a few of our students on here with us today. Uh, but we also, it's a very special day for us. And we have our, our panel that's made up of our advisory board. We do this every semester where we have our advisory board members who are available that day uh, to join in a panel discussion of uh, kind of events and of what's going on and what's going on in their businesses. And of course, today is, uh, <laughs> there's, there's a lot of material to discuss today. As we've done for the past few semesters, uh, we've asked to Elliot Falcione. Uh, Elliot, wave, where are you, Elliot? There you are. Okay. As soon as you speak, Elliot, your your video will come on for a uh, to moderate the panel. And uh, what we're going to do, uh, as we do every week in this class, we have the students in advance uh, to uh, to research. Of course, we have many speakers this week, so I divided the speakers up among the students. I divided it by the speakers who had not been in our class this semester. Some of you have been other semesters, but those who had not been this semester, uh, uh, they did the research and questions for, and Elliot has those questions. But we also uh, have many other speakers here today who hadn't been, who were here this semester, and for whom we have not written questions. So for students, and so that's Cole and Jordan and Juan, uh, if you all, and there'll be others coming on in a minute, I'm sure, if you all could participate, excuse me, and uh, uh, you know, ask questions for the folks uh, for whom Elliot doesn't have a specific question, uh, that'd be great because I think they all have a lot to offer and we'll help you with that. Uh, finally, uh, Elliot is going to uh, take over and uh, I don't know if all of you heard this, uh, the students know it every week, this is being recorded and uh, this week it's not only being recorded, it's being live cast on Facebook and YouTube and will be available on YouTube for all of you panel members, board members who uh, have an ego and want to give autographs out to your, to your audiences afterwards. I'm sure we can arrange for that. Elliot, I'm going to turn it over to you now to uh, start the program for us. Well, welcome everybody. Uh, I would say, Michael Clobber, you have the best background lighting out of all of us. So, <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, you, you must be an Ivy League grad. <laughs> and, uh, and Elliot, I forgot to do one thing before we continue. I always do it because I'm not in the room. I forgot it. So I don't know if you all see the, uh, the screen the same way I do. I don't think we all do. It looks like Hollywood Squares. But I'm going to start on my screen just in the order I see people to introduce them. And so just raise your hand when I introduce you so everybody knows who you are. I'm going to start with uh, Jiten Patel. And, uh, and Jay is the uh, owner and operator of the Holiday Inn Airport. And he's, uh, did you wave, Jay? Yes, this there is Jiten. Okay. And then next to uh, him is Virginia Haley. And Virginia is the, uh, is the head of uh, Visit Sarasota, which is the CVB basically for, uh, for Sarasota City and County. Next to Virginia is Ken Edwards. Ken is, uh, and these are all on our board of advisors. And Ken is the owner and operator of TriStar Hotels and HM Books Online. Next is John Horn. John is the infamous owner of Anna Maria Oyster Bar and operator of Sane. Then we have down here, Richard Weil. Richard, there you go. Richard uh, has had a checkered career doing many things. He was in food service uh, supply for many, many years in big companies. And uh, now he's a uh, very active consultant in uh, Colorado, but really all over the country. So welcome, Richard. Next him is Michael Clauber. Michael, you there? Yep. And Michael is uh, the owner operator, one of the owner operators of uh, on, uh, Michael's on East, but they also have a big catering company and he's very heavily involved in Sarah Bay too. Charles Giffler next to him, wave Charles. For years was associated with the Hyatt Hotel here in Sarasota and still uh, has an association 
and is a developer and has uh, two projects under construction right now. Great time to be under construction, I guess. <laughs> uh, down here is Rob Grimes. Rob is coming in from, where are you, Rob? Virginia, Maryland, something like that? Uh, Maryland. Maryland. And Rob is a technology guru uh, that I've known since I was at Penn State for years and years. And Rob just made the comment to please let the techie people handle the technology. So he puts me in Jihan's hands, you know. Um, Katie, we can't see Katie, but I'm sure it's Katie Moulton, even though her last name isn't on there. Katie, and Katie is, a, is the head of Cayuga Hospitality Consultants, Cornell University's uh, informal consulting company. You there, Katie? I am here. Okay. Did I, did I get your title right, Katie? Pretty much. Okay, good. Executive director and partner in the consulting group. We're 40, 40 consultants around the globe. There you go. Uh, next to Katie is, is Paul Madison. Paul Madison is the owner of Madison's Restaurants uh, in Sarasota and in, in Bradenton. And uh, Paul is uh, there by sound. Say hi, Paul. Hello, everybody. Okay. Hi, and uh, Rick hey, Benninghove. Rick Benninghove is the CEO, general manager of Longboat Key Club Hotel and Properties. Uh, Rick, are you? Can you hear us? I can. Uh, hello, everybody. Nice to see see you all. Okay. And uh, uh, Gil Reyes. Gil is uh, the general manager of the Westin Hotel in Sarasota. Hi, Gil. Hey, everyone. How are you? How are you? And Gil, you probably have two speakers going at one time there. Uh, Jason Pabst is, uh, is an alum, a fairly recent alum, and is the front office manager at the Lido Beach Hotel and uh, our newest board member. Um, did I miss any board members? Have I missed anybody? Okay. And of course, the infamous Elliot Falcione, who is the head of the, uh, of the Bradenton CVB and the Manatee County's Tourism Development Commission. Okay, Elliot, thanks. Uh, thank you, Dr. Pat. Uh, as the students know, there's a lot of the professors uh, viewing this as well, so they can chime in as seen fit. Um, we have about 15 uh, panelists uh, today, so uh, we're gonna try to show everybody a little bit of love, get some feedback from everybody. Uh, but I ask uh, these dynamic panelists to try to, uh, to keep your answers hopefully up to two minutes um, and because we may feed off of uh, a, a topic um, and ask uh, multiple people for some, some feedback based on what it is. But with that, I'm going to start with my, uh, my colleague to the south, uh, Virginia Haley. And uh, Virginia, it's great to see you uh, in these uh, tough times. Um, you have a crisis management plan uh, like most destination marketing organizations. You know, how, number one, how valuable is that uh, to, to a community for a leader like you, a destination marketing organization like you have that crisis management plan? And how do you gauge when people are ready to travel uh, when, the, when, the, when the country, the world is back open for business? Thanks, Elliot. It's good to see you, at least virtually. And yes, uh, we absolutely have a crisis management plan. Um, we've used it for a wide variety of things over the years. And look at all the fun we've had with the deep water oil spill, Zika, flesh eating bacteria, hurricanes, 9 11, uh, and none of them are uh, quite to the level that we're dealing with now. Um, but the basics of that plan, the chain of command, the absolute importance of communicating, if anything, over communicating, the bones of that plan are what you know, really get you through this kind of thing. And it's a plan that every year you're practicing. So we practice internally uh, with Visit Sarasota. And actually it, it's been about eight years. Sarasota County had a pandemic uh, exercise. I don't know if that was a statewide one, Elliot. Um, I do remember going through it and thinking, I don't see how tourism does anything but shut down in a case like this. And that wound up being true. In terms of recovery, making sure we're heeding the experts first and foremost. You don't want to go into recovery if your public health and your county and state government 
is still saying, don't do it. Uh, believe it or not, there are organizations who have done it in the past uh, and have ruined their reputations by jumping the gun. So first you wait for the all clear from the governments. Uh, and then really what, what we're doing is going in a multi-step process. And the first is looking very close to home, not spending very much money, but just testing that consumer sentiment. Are they willing to travel? We look for behaviors rather than um, area or age. So we're looking at behaviors of the first people to venture out and maybe buy a ticket to a performance. Uh, or other behaviors that indicate they might be willing to travel and serve a message to them. And from there it grows, but you really need to look at things like consumer sentiment. Um, we are discretionary spending, uh, and I think people's wallets are going to be very tight. So all of those factors will go into those initial steps of reaching out and getting our industry back. Thanks, Virginia. Uh, Mr. John Horn. Uh, nice shirt, Clemson grad. Are you there, John? Play the part for sure. Yes, John. Uh, you've been a long time uh, member of Florida Restaurant Lodging Association. Uh, we know regionally FRLA uh, covers Manatee and Sarasota. How valuable is it? Is it being a part of an organization organization like that, especially times like this? You know, I, I think it's invaluable, Elliot. I I was. Because of my um, relationship with the FRLA, I was asked to be on a, a town hall phone conversation with Senator Rick Scott yesterday. There, it was, he was reaching out to Manatee County for, I think, eight people from Manatee County, and it was an hour, and he just kind of a roundtable. Everybody got to give their, you know, here's what we're seeing, here's what we think we're going to have to do when we get back. And, and his suggestion was the association should come up with their own game plan, because we were asking you know, what do we do when we open up? Do we go back to 50% capacity in the restaurants? Do we have social distancing still? Will there be more carryout? And he said, each industry needs to formulate their own plan for when you come back. It's better to send it to the government. Here's what the hospitality industry will do. And so um, I've reached out to Carol Dover, the president of the FRLA, CEO, and said, you know, we need to form three committees. We need a bar committee a restaurant and a hotel committee. And, and all of us come up with, how do we want to open back up if we're allowed at 50% or whatever? Because no one has a game plan. We've never been through this. So I think the association and, the, and being connected with the association just will help that tremendously. But you know, it's gonna be tough for a lot. I was talking to John Saputo yesterday and he said he's already heard from 55 bar owners that they're, they're throwing the towel in. They're not even gonna come back from it. So there's going to be a hell of a, of a of fallback on this, you know? How, how many can survive something like this? So, I mean, when he said 50, one of the things was 20 to 40% will fall off during this pandemic. And he said he's already had 55 in Manti and Sarasota counties alone that said they're not coming back. It's going to be tough. But we all, I mean, having the association, having, you know, people that you can rely on, nobody's got an answer, but if we all work together, we'll get through it. Michael Clobber, uh, original member of the Originals Group. Um, you've always believed in it. it it's been a, a nice fraternity uh, for uh, for uh, man, the restaurants, uh, the food and beverage service. Um, what does it mean today? I know you got some initiatives going on to try to feed the restaurants that are in dire need, delivery, takeout. Uh, how important is the Originals today? Well, I mean, John just started it to, uh, to um, touch on it, but, you know, for a lot of the restaurants, we're 60 restaurants from tip of Anna Maria Island all the way down to Venice Pass. And they're very diverse from, you know, fine dining to breakfast mom and pops. Um, so it's really been um, incredibly challenging to try and help all the, the individual restaurants sorting through the PPP plan. Um, being able to give them advice um, or recommendations on um, resources because um, for a lot of them um, it's been, it's super challenging a lot of the employees are, are struggling in our state to be able to even get their unemployment processed so as a, the originals organization we are um, 
we are very, very busy and starting to think about, you know, John just touched on it, you know, tr trying to develop something for best practices for reopening. And, and, you know, I think we're all hoping that between your organization and, and Virginia um, and our uh, visit Sarasota, that there's funding to be able to, um, to put out there to help um, Florida and our region recover. So we're super busy right now. Um, I think I feel pretty lucky that we were um, able to flip the switch from uh, serving in the restaurant to takeout and delivery. And um, it's got 10 of our staff um, working full time. We're hoping to close on our PPP loan and bring back 60 or 70 more next week, um, uh, whether they're working or not, I guess. But um, so, yeah, just I don't think I've ever been busier than I am right now. Well, Michael and, and John, uh, Virginia and I totally agree. We all need to be communicating uh, consistently. Uh, Michael, you've given me a heads up on some initiatives that I wasn't aware of. Um, so thank you. Um, and just work with each other and leverage partnerships. With that, Charles, you've been a, a Sarasota businessman for years uh, to the students. How important is it for leaders to be leaders now and put aside arrogance and a selfish mindset and do things for the greater good of the community? Uh, and, and at the same time, we have to, you know, worry about ourselves individually. But, but how important is, is uh, leaders being leaders, especially in times like this? Well, these, thank you, Elliot. Th these are the times that trust men's souls, trust men and women's uh, steel. Uh, test it and and um, we're going to look back on this period like we remember we might remember our grandparents or great grandparents <clears throat> talking about the Great Depression um, because as Virginia said nothing that we've done in the past prepares us for what's happening today and uh, I, I couldn't be more pleased though to be uh, to be aware of and and friends with most of uh, of, of everyone that's on this call very proud of this group. Leadership is the key. Um, but um, if you're a student and you're going into the business now, uh, <laughs> you're, you're learning how to swim by jumping into the deep end with, with some cinder blocks tied to your ankles. But I have a feeling that most of, uh, most of the students that, uh, that go to this great institution are up, are up for the job. And um, it's going to be exciting. There's going to be a lot of, of um, challenges. And yet, there is no debate about the extraordinary and enviable long term and maybe even intermediate term demographics for, this, for the Sarasota area, uh, for the state of Florida, and for our industry. Uh, it's just that in the short term, and you know, someone was just asking me today, I'm on a, another board call later today, and we, we produce a financial advisor magazine, and we're planning our conferences for next year. And they said, Charles, you're the conference guy. What do we do about conferences? And it's, it's going to be very challenging. Um, it's going to be very interesting to see how we get people to physically attend conferences, because, uh, you know, this... This video conferencing only goes so far. And I only, ra I only raise that point because it has so much to do with um, the growth area of hospitality, even in our region, you know, where you've got a beach hotel that's building close to 30,000 square feet of meeting space. We've got one in, um, uh, on Longbow Key that's going to build quite a bit of uh, meeting space. And, um, and downtown, all the new hotels pushed it as far as they could. So, um, uh, where are those, are those conferences going to come back when, and, you know, we need the vaccine, we need the testing, but, but there again, if you're coming out of school right now, I mean, it's, it's a very exciting period because within certainly 12 months, things should be, you know, back coming back to normal. Some people think we won't be shaking hands though, Elliot. I don't know what your view is on that. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, we Italians like to give hugs, you know, so uh, we're huggers. Yeah. Thanks, Charles. Uh, Ken Edwards, uh, live from the Valley of the Sun. Uh, it's great to see you, sir. Uh, finishing up your master's degree with uh, USF. 
Uh, Dr. Pat said you're not on academic probation, so great job on the studies. Um, with you, with your business, um, you know, owning, uh, managing multiple hotels, we're just coming on the tail end of a hotel boom. Ken, uh, what's going to happen here? Are we going to see a lot of hotels go through foreclosure? How are they going to weather this storm? Or is there just an unknown out there at this point? Yeah, yeah. you know, Dr. Pat and I have talked about this a couple times. The only thing that really brings back the hotel industry is when they figure out the airline solution. Um, so um, until they can solve that problem, uh, the hotel industry will continue to be sluggish and uh, lag as, as a business. Uh, as compared to the other hospitality businesses, perhaps restaurants and so on and so forth. So uh, very simply, as soon as somehow they figure out the airline uh, travel, uh, business will come back as it was. And uh, once that occurs, then we'll, we'll be fine. The question is, you know, who's going to get on an airplane? I know that when we, we all break for our 15 minute break, ask yourself that question. When are you going to get on an airplane? Katie Moulton, uh, you're- I, uh, Could I just have one quick follow-up? Yes, sir. Ken, just for a second. Ken, I, I had a note here written to myself uh, in, in case we don't get back to you soon. But what about from a small hotel perspective? Your places are 80, 90, 100, 150, 200 rooms. What, well, 200 is not small, but I mean, what, how do you compare that to some of the big properties you've, you've been chatting about? It's, it's, it's all relevant in the sense that um, you know, in February, all of my hotels, which were uh, 10 that I own and 22 that I manage, were running between 70 and 90% occupancy and ran that occupancy for uh, all of 2019. Every hotel is in single digits. When I say single digit, not occupancy, but room eight, nine, 10, seven, every one of them in Dallas, Texas, and in Indianapolis, and in San Jose, California, and Phoenix, Arizona. And I speak to all my friends, they say exactly the same thing. So, um, you know, the larger hotels, the difference really is like when I bleed, I bleed about $10,000 uh, a month right now. Uh, if you're a large hotel, um, it can be probably close to a half a million dollars a month or maybe even greater. So if you're asking what is the difference between a 150 room hotel and perhaps a resort in Sarasota is, um, is, is how much money you lose when you have no revenue. Thank you, Ken, and thank you for letting me interrupt, Elliot. Sure. You're welcome, Dr. Pat. Uh, Katie Moulton, uh, being a, a consultant, uh, what kind of calls are you getting? Uh, you have uh, an entrepreneurial background. Uh, times like this, uh, should you have some contingencies uh, in your back pocket, uh, even though something like this uh, may run out pretty fast? Uh, what, what are your thoughts based on um, the kind of feedback you're getting from your, some of your clients? Um, thank you. So we expected the funnel of consulting assignments to dry up the way you would, you know, you would expect every business to go. But instead, what's happened is a lot of the hoteliers paired their staff so much that now they're looking at situations, financial issues, they're uncovering fraud situations that they didn't know they had because now the entire accounting staff is gone. And um, there are some properties that are continuing their development. They need some help with uh, managing their um, their um, their capital. You know, the capital that they had planned was going to go towards one thing. Now they realize that they've got other properties they might need to use some of that for. Uh, it's really interesting the kind of calls that we're getting. Um, we are also expecting a lot of task force work coming up over the next six months as the properties ramp back up before they're able to put teams together. So um, because our consultants are all over the, uh, the, the world basically and covering so many different areas of expertise, um, we think consulting is actually going to do well for at least the short term uh, while the hotels get, get ramped back up. But unfortunately, not everybody is in an area where they can repurpose their hotels. Um, and there's been an awful lot of that, as you all have been reading. So many of the properties are moving towards housing, first responders, um, non-COVID patients out of the hospital, um, homeless. Uh, you know, some people are just doing whatever they can to, to put heads in bed. So none of us have ever been down this road before. Most of us have been involved in previous recessions, but nothing that ever looked quite like this. 
Thanks, Katie. Uh, Gill, uh, the West End, I still look at that as a new property, a uh, beautiful property. Uh, what are you telling your employees uh, during times like this and uh, any opportunities uh, that you're working on just to kind of keep some kind of revenue stream a little bit, maybe what Katie had mentioned? So first of all, uh, thanks for having me. Uh, the biggest thing that we just need to keep everyone positive and things, although things are really tough now, the sun will rise again and making sure that the team understands that and that culture is still uh, at our hotel with regards to keeping everyone positive and understanding that it's going to get better. Uh, with regards to other opportunities, you know, uh, we have takeout and um, we put together several different menu items because we were fortunate to be in downtown. So we have several condos there around us. So we're marketing our to go menu. We're actually doing a, we did a, because uh, Weston is a wellness brand. So it, we had, we put together a 500 calorie a bowl in which it's pre-prepared. They could take it home and um, reheat it. And then it's, it's, we can deliver it from our end. So we're doing a lot of little different things like that. We've also opened up the employee rate and a lot of uh, people have been being able to use it, like team members from other throughout the state that just want to get away out of the house, working with the, um, the local airlines and 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 air, the the airport at Sarasota, working with them to make sure that they understand that we have rooms available for them. So we're we're we all we do have to reinvent ourselves at the property, and the team is excited. I've got sales managers cleaning rooms. We've got our director of finance checking people in. We're a full service hotel, so a little bit different with regards to job responsibilities. But everyone has been all in and, and everyone's very appreciative that we're still open. Gil, I guess this is an opportunity for all of us to build a little bit of character. Absolutely. Uh, like this. Um, I'm going to try to lighten this up a little bit. Uh, uh, Paul Madison, uh, one of the students uh, asked the question, uh, what food inspires you the most and how are you handling uh, the pandemic right now at Madison's? What was the first question, Elliot? What food what? inspires you the most and you better say Italian. <laughs> <laughs> Paul is half Italian for those of you who don't know. Uh, what food inspires me the most? Gosh, um, you know, as a, as a chef, I, I have a palate and a taste for everything, I think, and I enjoy a little bit of everything. But, but yes, I grew up in an Italian family and I always do tend to lean back toward that, uh, toward that direction. Um, you know, it's funny, I've been cooking dinner at home more often than, uh, more lately than I have in years. Um, as much as uh, you would like to think that a chef cooks dinner every night at home for their family, we're often so busy that it doesn't happen as often as we'd like. But I find myself uh, regressing and reverting back to some of the things that, that uh, you know, I ate as a kid growing up, you know, some fun, simple peasant Italian dishes, you know, beans and greens and, and things like that. My kids love all that stuff. It's funny. I I stretch out in a different direction. We did some, uh, I had some uh, center cut boneless pork loins that uh, I did the other night and um, I did something different. I went off on like this curry rub crust and, and I uh, made like a little chutney to go with it. And both of them were looking at me like, mm, is there any lasagna left from last night? <laughs> so, uh, you know, I, I find myself heading back toward uh, some of the things that inspires me most. Um, in the restaurants over the past several years, we've really focused on natural ingredients, um, using um, antibiotic-free, hormone-free meats, things that uh, come from small, sustainable family farms. And um, so anytime you're using the right ingredients and uh, preparing things freshly and from scratch, that's, I think, what inspires me most as far as food goes. Um, as far as how we're handling the, the pandemic at this point, um, we made a decision early on not to continue with revenue. We decided not to do the takeout route and and uh, and just really hunker down. And we uh, we kind of thoroughly cleaned everything and we we doled out a lot of the um, remaining ingredients, perishable ingredients that we had uh, to our staff and encouraged everyone to you know to stay home, to stay safe, and um, and to try to get through it as quickly as we could. Um, what we have been doing as far as feeding folks is one day a week, we've been um, flushing out meals to the local hospitals and the fire stations and the emergency workers. 
And we partnered with some companies. It's been interesting. A couple of uh, one of my clients approached me and said, you know, what can we do? Who can we feed? There's people out there that need to be fed. What, what can we, what can we do? He said, if I help you sponsor something, can we get some meals out? So that's kind of how it started. And so we've partnered with with several different companies in the area that that have helped to sponsor the cost of some of the meals. And um, and we're just, you know, I, I know what we're going to put out. Um, we can. Um, you know, not have to set up a lot of people. I can have one chef come in and prepare several items and, uh, and one or two people at a time working tandemly in different parts of the kitchen so they're not side by side keeping them safe. And then we're preparing, you know, like I say, a couple of two or 300 meals a day and, and pushing those out um, um, on a delivery basis and sending them to people that really need it. And we started with the healthcare workers. We think those are the people that are on the front lines helping, uh, helping people to stay alive and risking their own health to, to be able to do that. Um, went on to some first responders, um, and I've also had a, a couple other people that approached me and said, you know, there's some some feeding kitchens, and, and uh, there's a program called Second Chance Last, Second Chance Last Opportunity that has been handing out meals in, in neighborhoods, and um, and then a new thing that we just came up with today that we're going to do is um, uh, we're going to start to we're starting to think about how we're going to re-enter. We're starting to get to the point of, of you know when when it is time to come back, what's it going to look like and what's going to happen and what are we going to what are we going to do different? Um, we're talking about getting together with our our management team and with some of our, our real creative uh, staff members and starting to brainstorm on you know potentially some new menu ideas. We want to we want to come back with some some fresh ideas and some fresh things happening. So. We're going to start to uh, put different things together, and we're also going to talk about, you know, what are, what what is our services going to look like? Are we, are we going to have to we're going to have to approach things differently? And are we going to be a stronger takeout model? Are people going to want food either delivered or picked up more often than, than dining in? Are people going to be shy about coming to restaurants and sitting in them? So we we're talking about really focusing on some of those type of menus as we get back to things. Uh, even our catering business, you know, will be, there be less large-scale sit-down affairs for a little while, and will people be more interested in, in, um, in again, more uh, prepared platters and, and simpler fare that that uh, we can provide for people. So we're 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 going to stay flexible because we don't really know what it's going to look like. We're going to we're going to uh, um, brainstorm different ideas and really see what people want and what people need, and and kind of react accordingly to. To what the opportunities are, but it's it's going to be a tough restart. It's going to be slow. I, I'm, you know, I, I wonder, you know, if we'll limit our menus and have smaller menus as we we reapproach and get back into things. But um, you know, all options are on the table. Of course, we're open, hoping for the doors to open and for everything to be gangbusters again. But you know, we have to face the fact that, you know, not only are people going to be more concerned and traveling less, but for our economy here in Florida, you know, we miss the season. It 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 cut us off at the knees right as we were hitting our stride, right as we were in the midst of it. And we're going to come back to the summer months, which is typically our slowest time. So we're going to have to be very careful about what we do and how we do it and, uh, and keep an open mind and, and uh, hope for the best. But, um, you know, we'll come back from it. We will we will uh, be back at what we do and do well, but uh, it's going to look different, and we've got to all keep an open mind about it. Thanks, Paul. Uh, Michael, I, oh, that's a segue. We talked a little bit about Paul's uh, – favorite food. Uh, you've been known as uh, the wine connoisseur of Sarasota for many, many years. Uh, number one, what's your favorite wine? And number two, how important is your wine menu uh, to your overall brand of your organization? Well, you know, the wine part of our industry has been something that's inspired me um, food-wise from my early days at the colony, traveling to Europe to go and learn about it. So, um, you know, wine is a huge part of, of our program. And, you know, in traveling to those regions around the world to, uh, to explore those areas, you come back with great ideas all the time, new dishes, new concepts. Um, we're um, incorporating uh, wine and spirits into the takeout program that we've developed um, online right now, um, doing some innovative things with the wine and spirits store, some, um, online virtual tastings, things like that, to keep that going. Um, but yeah, I mean, wine and food are the, na are the, great, the great match. Um, so it's, um, it's a huge part of our business, always has been, always will be. And, and it's an inspiration to, um, to all of us as we explore new wines from new regions. And you know, 
you probably know I have quite a passion for South Africa these days and what a great wine growing region. But I, on top of that, what an amazing food region um, with different seafoods that we don't see here. So um, yeah, wine is still a, a great passion and um, a great part of our, our, our bigger, bigger program. Do you have a favorite glass of wine, bottle of wine? I tend to uh, lean towards the what I call the old world style or European wines and particularly Bordeaux and Burgundy um, right now. Um, but, you know, ha having all this time um, at home, we're dipping into the cellar and opening up some some great old bottles. And um, Terry and I are really having fun with that on a couple of nights and, and surprising ourselves with things that Oh, I think that one's probably too old, but maybe not. So, um, and trying things from different regions that have just been waiting. So we've used this as a great excuse to um, dip into the deeper depths of the cellar. Well, I'll come over tonight wearing a mask if you need help with that cellar. <laughs> I don't think my <laughs> wife will let you in. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Chit Patel, the owner, uh, general manager of the Holiday Inn uh, Sarasota Airport. Chitena, I guess I just learned something uh, about you uh, from a student. Uh, Chitena is on our Tourist Development Council for Manatee County. The question is, how do you balance being part owner of a bank uh, that apparently I did not know and being a hotelier? And uh, why did you make the switch from being an engineer to becoming a hotelier? Okay, wow, very good question. Somebody is researching thorough about our business community around here. But Actually, I'm a professionally structural engineer, but uh, working with the state of New York, I have found the ceiling as where I can go from here. There was too much competition in engineering business. All the manufacturing and all the bigger stuffs are even going out of the country back those days. I'm talking about back in late 80s, early 90s. And uh, decided to get into the business. At that point, engineering business was tough to go into the engineering business, so decided to go into the hospitality. Started with a small project as owner operator of a small hotel and came up to the point where I've been in a 25 years in the business, enjoying greatly this business. So I would say I love my guests and I feel that my, I, am born for hospitality. I enjoy interacting with different guests every single day and great to know about them and their history as well as they know about us. And banking is one of the challenging field even today. It's in a community banks right now, I cannot go and apply for any loan because they feel that is director being in a devastated situation, even the whole world is in devastated situation. So banking is great, but it should be a lot better or a little bit more relaxed from FDIC while either SBA and FDIC does not talk hands to hands, whatever the PPP or EIDL that you take from the SBA, it's not the financial situation of the director itself, it's the business situation in today's condition. So that's how the banking works. So regulations are very tight and FDIC has not relaxed any regulations for the banking industry. Banking is not even qualifying for the PPP or uh, any kind of other loans from the federal programs. Now, when it comes to the business, like I'm a kind of uh, new compared to all you guys with 20. Uh, are you, is someone speaking? Go ahead. Okay, actually, when I look at uh, the banking industry, or sorry, the business industry, it is, uh, for me, I'm 25 years in the business. I have seen some ups and downs in the business, but this is one of the worst thing. And as a lot of others say that nobody has seen this time 
in our lifetime, and I totally agree with it, businesses are significantly down. Simple way to put it is right now, normally what we should be doing as a gross revenue, you generate that in a week. So I would say probably around 15% of a gross revenue that comes to the business. That is a devastated situation. Definitely. Main concern that what government has been down is trying to help the small people where they can make their living. That would be the great aspect of how the funds should be funneled down to, not like uh, what happened in the past with uh, 2008 crisis. We don't want to see the only big banks getting the money and that does not funnel down to small people. So right now, I think this funding, the way they structured it, it's gonna work. The only concern as a business owner, as a lot of employees who is on unemployment today's day and age, they may not go back to work because with federal fundings and they are getting the federal unemployment for $600 plus $275 total together, like $875 a week, they would have challenging time to convince, or business owners, business managers would have challenging time to convince for them to go back to work. Even businesses getting help in turn of PPP. So unemployment rate probably would not go down unless government stop funding the random amount by uh, weekly unemployment claim by the federal government, $600 a week. They should limit that amount. But other than that, that we all know that this is not the time that we ever kind of dream to even look at this, you know? Great. Thank you. Thank you, Jatin. Uh, Dick Rivera, uh, owner of um, uh, a great barbecue restaurant in Sarasota. Uh, question from one of the students, uh, what advice uh, would you give a restaurant manager when dealing with difficult employees? There's probably a really short answer to that question, um, but I'll, I'll expand on it a little bit. Um, how do you handle difficult employees and how do you recruit people in a manner that gives you a better chance to having good employees in your organization? Can, can, we just take, can I just take the rest of the panel time here? <laughs> so first of all, it's great to join us the first time I've been on. Uh, fascinated to listen to you all, so thank you. Um, I'm not getting Dick's audio very well. I don't know if he can, you can get a little closer. Is that helping? Try it now, Dick. Here. Go ahead. I'm sorry. I'm not, I'm not quite proficient with all this. Can you hear me? That's a little bit better. Okay, well, I'll try to lean in a little closer here. Uh, I'm, Are I'm you running, you running your phone and your computer simultaneously? I'm not. I'm just on the computer. Okay. That's better, That's better, Dick. Yeah. So, um, you know, difficult employees, I think, uh, difficulties arise when people are not aligned. And so I think that the, the best way to try and deal with that, uh, I would call it proactively or preemptively, is to make sure that we do a good job of communicating sort of what the expectations are and then being consistent and um, applying the standards and dealing with situations as they arise rather than letting them fester. And, uh, and then if someone really is difficult, I think ultimately, I'm a big fan of Danny Meyer's sort of covenantal relationship. He says that he, he's very clear about expectations and he's very clear about what they can expect from him. And they have that agreement up front before they ever start to work. And so we try and do that. Um, we, we, we're not 100% on it, I would say, but we generally try and be really clear on what they can expect from us and what we are gonna expect from them. And that usually gives you the opportunity to deal with these difficult situations as they arise. And if they don't, uh, it doesn't mean that the person is not a good person and a good worker, it just means maybe they should be a good worker for someone else. <laughs> so that's kind of blunt, but I think, you know, you, you have to do your job to make sure that expectations are clear, that you're treating people um, fairly and um, uh, and that you're communicating well. And if you are, then there's only so much I think you can do. And then the last question, the second question I think had to do with how do you find good employees? Was that the question? 
Yes, sir. And um, I would start by, uh, we, we look for people that have what we call the hospitality gene and uh, the people that really enjoy being of service to others. Um, and the way, one way I used to talk about that is uh, if you walk into a restaurant that's busy, it's full and uh, people are laughing and they're toasting each other and eating off each other's plate. And if that doesn't put a little zing in your step and a little lift in your heart, then you're in the wrong business. You ought to go do something else because that's what we do. You know, we host and we entertain and create experiences for people. And so if that's not where your heart is, you should really go do something else because it's hard work and uh, can sometimes be trying uh, in dealing with people. And so if you don't have the right sort of mindset about hospitality, I think it's gonna be very difficult to really be good at what you do. You might be good mechanically, but you won't be a good server, bartender, manager, whatever the case might be. And so we start there and, um, uh, and then we focus on training. And again, the expectations part. And you know, ours is a kind of a low key restaurant. So we, what we focus on is points of service, um, but a really relaxed style. I mean, it's barbecue after all, which is about usually eating with your hands and uh, in a real convivial kind of community-like environment. So we don't want to be formal, but we do want to be on it. I mean, we want to handle things properly and have the right steps of service. So it's kind of a loose type property, I would say, where um, we want to be tight on the fundamentals and loose in terms of the atmosphere that we create so people can be comfortable. And I think people like working in that environment. So that's kind of what we do. And I think it's, it's worked for us. We've, we've always had the, the friendly part of it, I think we've had from day one. The steps of service and the, and the standards sometimes we miss. So we've got to keep working on that. Thanks. Uh, John Horn, I, I know we talk a lot about how you motivate your employees. You take them to Orlando once a year. Uh, do you want to just um, offer a little bit more advice of really you've had employees work for you uh, as long as you've probably been owner of the Oyster Bar. Why is that? Well, I, just what Dick said. I mean, you've got to find the people that, that love the industry first. Um, the people that have been in it for a long time or that just come, come in and, and absolutely love what they do, they'll be with you forever because you've got managers that are supporting them that love what they do. And that, I mean, it just, it breeds that, that, that love of the industry. I mean, I had a, an, a great uncle that was in the business a thousand years ago. And he asked me one time, he said, you know, how's the business? I said, I love it. He said, I didn't ask you that. He said, if you're in it, you love it. So, and, and just like Dick said, I mean, if, if you love your industry, you, you'll enjoy every day you ever work. Cause it is a tough business. You know, I, I tease a lot. I said, it's the easiest job in the world. People come in the front door. No one goes to a restaurant for a bad time. They come in the door to have a good time. It's just, it's our job to make sure that they can have good food, good service, and a good ambience. So it's an easy job if you have the right attitude. Um, we take care of our people. We try to listen to them. I've got four WhatsApp um, groups going right now with all my staff from all four of the restaurants. And so we're telling them what we're doing, <laughs> sending them pictures. We have gutted our kitchen in Cortez completely gutted it there's there's not a stick of equipment in it. we're redoing the floor we're redoing all the walls dr new drop ceiling and i'm sending them pictures so they know that we're putting money back into the plant we're um we're putting new point of sale machines in all three of the the stores that are closed right now uh with the kds system in the back we're sending them pictures of the new setup for to all the staff we want to keep them involved um you know we're paying a full tilt right now while while they're all gone so I'm hoping my SBA gets approved really quickly. But they were, they were blown away when they, I mean, we full, full tips as well. So, you know, they, they're just blown away and that's what you got to do. You got to take care of your staff. You really do. Great. Uh, Dr. Pat, I'm going to ask two more questions and then if we have time to open it up to the class, uh, any other questions, but, um, Jason, um, Pabst, uh, Lido Beach uh, manager, uh, what would you tell students that are they're in school uh, pursuing the hospitality degree and a crisis like this comes up? And of course, I'm sure they're losing sleep at nighttime. Any advice, uh, you being a manager uh, at a great resort on Lido Key? And, uh, and then also quickly, you know, what's going on in your mind um, uh, during this crisis? Sure, absolutely. Um, so first of all, I would like to just quickly um, thank uh, this board for extending me the opportunity to be a member of it. 
Um, so to address the, the first question, um, you know, I've been, I, prior to being in the hotel industry, I was in property management, residential property management for quite some time. Um, and then I recently shifted over to the ho hotel industry about two years ago. And so in that time, I've already experienced red tide. And just um, subjectively speaking, I thought that was the worst possible thing that could happen in our area. So, and it did give me a lot of insights and experience um, because there are some parallels, I think, that I can um, form between that and what's currently going on. But um, this is obviously um, on a whole nother level of just um, the, the way it's devastated um, both my hotel and the industry in general in the region. Um, so I, I will say just anecdotally speaking, um, for any students who are concerned um, that this might be the wrong industry to be going into, or who are concerned that maybe this, they are not in the correct um, program at school, I have to attest to the fact that um, due to my work ethic and due to the fact that I do hold a college degree, I was on the very short list of employees that were retained um, when the general manager made the decision to start furloughing staff. Um, so I am thankful for that, um, but it, it, it is a very interesting experience nonetheless. Um, and uh, my main priority at this point, um, besides taking care of our guests, is obviously um, supporting my staff, um, staying in constant communication with them. And uh, I think the, the second part of the question, what was it? Just if you could. What's going that. on in your head right now? Uh, and I think you pretty much answered it. Uh, they've retained you. Uh, are you sleeping well? Um, is the unknown uh, kind of eating you up inside a little bit of when, when this recovery is going to hit? Well, it, it, it is in a way simply because, you know, speaking with my fellow co-workers and um, employees, I many of them are under the impression that we're just going to, you know, flip a switch and everything will be 100% back to normal um, at, you know, full operational capacity. I think that's... Um, probably a little misguided and I've been I've been very candid and open with them and in, in discussing that that you know this will be a, a slow ramp up um, I anticipate the economy and financial implications of this pandemic will definitely force us to be uh, very nimble in adapting to issues and finding solutions going forward great thanks great job Jason uh, Richard will uh, uh, Virginia you have a comment yeah, to turn your microphone on, Virginia. Lower left-hand corner. Lower left, your other left. Yeah. There we go. Um, thank you, Elliot. I just, um, listening to Jason, doesn't it make you proud of this program? Um, he's so thoughtful. He really understands the nuances and levels, and we're excited to have you on the board, Jason. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, Virginia. Richard, Thanks, are you still on? Richard, we have, he may have bounced out. Uh, I apologize for that, trying to get everybody in. Um, I think what we're going to do, Dr. Patton, let's uh, maybe Richard will pop back on. I'll oh, here he is. On. Richard, are you there? Okay, well, while we're waiting, I'll send him a text. Well, he might okay, have great. Uh, Dr. Pat, Jihan, do you want to field some questions from students that are listening in? Yeah, and let me just uh, tell you that we've got some great students on here. Hey, Jason, we see your picture. Wonderful. Uh, we have Mason who joined us uh, during the uh, during the the uh, program. And actually, Mason works for uh, for Gill at the at the Westin. Or at least he was. I don't know. Are you still doing the night audit, Mason? Yeah, I'm still doing it. And you're awake. Thank you. You're a trooper, Mason. No worries. And we have Cole. We have Clara. We have Jordan. We have Juan. Uh, so if any of you would like to jump in with a question, we would love to have you. And, and Richard Weil, are you back on yet or not? Okay, <laughs> students, go ahead. There's Richard. Okay. I'm back. Why don't you, 
Yeah, hold it for one I, second. My, my froze. Will, go ahead, Elliot, with Richard. Hey, Richard, uh, last but not least, uh, you, you operate a national restaurant consulting firm. And is your group now anticipating trying to basically shift gears uh, to anticipate some very unique uh, questions from the restaurant industry on the recovery side? Um, I'm sure it's not going to be the same normal consultant that you've been offering uh, during your time, but what are you expecting to hear from your clients moving forward? Thank you. Uh, sorry, my for some reason it froze. So yes, we were in a search and rescue mode for maybe, I think that's what we've coined it as a team for the last three or four weeks. We're now in a recovery mode, as you put, Elliot. Um, I think for now, we're doing everything pro bono. We're not charging a single client for anything. Uh, which is very difficult to do from an economic standpoint for our team. But the restaurant industry, uh, as we know, is week to week. Their capital is certainly limited. And uh, the full service segment has been severely impacted, as we've heard. Some have just shuttered for now. Uh, we're estimating between 20 and 25 percent main. Richard, you're freezing again. Open. We're here for our clients. We're saying, in this, and I'm going to read this and then go to the students. In this business, we show love and compassion, laugh as much as possible, dream bigger than ever, be grateful, have fun again, and cheer for our community and industry and country. And that is what we're doing right now as a team with our new white paper that we hope to publish this week as far as a recovery. Uh, we're essentially putting out a business model to share on how to recover and how to reopen and best practices all the way from HR to a business plan, real estate, financial. So I think that sums it up best as to what we're doing as a restaurant consulting team. And I'd be happy to share that with everybody if anybody wants that uh, quote that we came up with as a team because we think it's very purposeful and very meaningful. Richard, I'm glad that I, I had you last. Uh, you finished it off perfectly. If you could share that with Dr. Pat, uh, he will get it to the board members. I can't thank you enough. Um, uh, Dr. Pat, uh, are you ready for some student questions? We, before We, we, we are. Students, you want me to pick on you or to, like I always do, or does somebody want to start off? Uh, I'd love to start off. Go ahead, Cole. So, Michael, actually. Cole, let's question. see your handsome face while you're on. There we go. Okay, so uh, Michael, I have a question for you. Uh, <clears throat> so I just have for Easter had a seven person order for your Michael's at home. Have you done anything to market that more in the Sarasota area or are you good with where you're sitting right now with business? Um, we've been, we felt very, very lucky um, with the response that we've gotten to the Michael's at Home program. And um, we actually served more meals on Easter Sunday than we would have if we would have been open for brunch, believe it or not. Um, so thank you for your support. Um, it's, uh, we are doing a lot of marketing, um, a lot of social media, um, taking advantage of uh, banner well, yeah, ads. Didn't realize I'm like Excuse me, Michael. Rob, please uh, mute your microphone. Thank you. So it's it's definitely a time to be to be marketing if you're open and you're serving and keeping it fresh. We just did it, we just added a whole new section to the takeout menu um, today, and you know we're gonna we, we had a great it was crazy last week with Passover, lobster pot on Friday and Easter, um, but now it's kind of like you know for the next probably six weeks. We've got to keep it fresh, and, and um, we will be doing a lot of marketing. Um, same thing for the wine and spirits store. It's just keeping it in people's minds, trying some new things on Instagram and Facebook and Twitter, and I'm learning it as quickly as I can. Um, I built the website that we're using for the online ordering. Um, um, so, yeah, I'm very involved in it, and... Um, you got to keep it moving. It's just not going to come to you. You got to go get it right now. And I'm so excited to hear from some of these guys about, you know, developing some best practices for reopening. I'm hoping I'm get, going to get to talk to John about maybe working with the FRLA group that he's um, talking about too, because between the originals and that group, um, we have quite a few of the top restaurants in the region and we need to all be 
getting on the same page. Thank you, Michael. Thank you. Uh, more students. Uh, we have uh, we have Mason. We have Clara. We have Jordan. Anybody here have a question that you'd like to ask? Not all at once. We have eight minutes left. <laughs> I have I have a question if uh, students do not. Yeah, and I do too. I have okay. a question. Okay, here we go. I hear a, a I hear a, a a female voice. Me, Jordan. Hi. Jordan. Hi, Jordan. Okay, so they say that when this pandemic is over, that everything is going to be different. Um, I guess this is kind of a relative question, but in the different fields of hospitality, like restaurants and hotels, what are the top three? things that you think are going to change the most? Like what policies and how you manage the takeaways, top three? If you'll just say, can I field the question for a second? Yeah. yeah. Um, I'm not gonna answer your question and someone else will have to answer it from a restaurant or a house point of view, but the real question is education change. How are you, the students, going to change? I think you're gonna see a lot more online courses at USF. Um, using products such as Zoom, um, it may be asynchronistic type of, of courses. I know Chian's looking at those type of online courses. Real question is, i.e. this fall, are you going to be in the classroom? But I'll let the rest of them talk about uh, the hospitality business and how it might affect them. Anybody else have a comment? Richard? I, I would turn the question around. I mean, how do you feel about online becoming a trend before this COVID, uh, COVID uh, virus caught hold? And, so, and back to Ken's point, if this fall you don't join with a lot of other students, you don't, you're not going to quite get that same energy as we all get when we're in the same room, which probably people in the hospitality field, you know, are are um you know alike anyway so that would be and then i had a finance point to make at some point jordan he, he, go ahead you have a response um, well i was already on a split schedule so i did half my classes on campus and half my classes online which was really really beneficial for me because i like online classes um just the ability to do them on my own time but i also like being in the classroom and getting that interaction with my peers and my professors because it helps you stay motivated. So I think a lot of students, and I mean, I have a lot of friends at other different campuses that are really struggling with even coming in and doing the Zoom call or, you know, or they get it, it it's hard. It, it's definitely a change, but I think it depends on the student. Like some people are going to continue to want to get their education and want to be present and other people only went because they had to. They it, still it, want the education, but a lot of, some students really just didn't like going to class. They'd rather just do their stuff at home. Yeah. Richard, I can you answer one of your questions, by the way, on the hotel side. Um, just uh, like what challenges are you already grappling with as an operator and when this pandemic ends and everything reopens, is there going to be a change? Absolutely, I, I think so. And I think, and I'll pick on one of your classmates, Mason, uh, who works for us uh, as a night auditor, but Mason brings so much to the table and I'm not just calling him out in front of everyone, but I'm just telling him how great of an employee he is and the staff and Cole, we miss you too, buddy. But at, at the end of the day, Mason was able to work in night audit and then also work the front desk. We're also gonna start having him do several projects throughout the hotel. And, you know, being diversified and understanding different departments where sometimes we, we go into like, let's say food and beverage, and we only wanna be in food and beverage, or you go into the room side, you only wanna work on the room side. Currently, right now, everyone's doing everything. So being able to understand different aspects of the business is gonna be so critical for your development and for the future of the business as well. And then one last comment, uh, for me, it's just, and I mentioned this earlier, two comments actually, just keeping everyone motivated. That's, that's all we can do right now. We know that the, mar the market right now, it's, it's, it's quiet and there's not a lot of stuff going on, but keeping everyone motivated because it's going to come back. And when it does, we're going to be stronger than ever. And the other thing I have to say is um, I was in your shoes. So I was a sophomore when 9-11 happened. 
And I was a night manager at a, at a, at a Sheridan in Fort Lauderdale Beach market, just absolutely tanked, similar to not as bad as this, but it was, it was rough. And we all had to take large pay cuts, big layoffs. And I was supposed to be a lawyer. And I got out of, I, I said, you know what? I fell in love with the business and the hospitality industry because of the camaraderie of everyone wanting to help each other out during that time period. And that's why I said, forget law school. I'm going to be a hotel manager. That's what I want to do. And that's how I really fell in love with the business. Unfortunately, it happened during a rough time period. But for me, that's, that's where it all came together. So just food for thought for you. It's, um, yeah. it, it's going to get better. Thank you, Gil. Uh, Dick, wow, you had a, you were going to say something. And then back to Charles Gipler, who had a finance comment. All right. So I think you're going to see a few quick components. One, life, health, safety will become a new norm for our industry and dealing with all operational con components, at least until consumer confidence and that new norm of what consumer confidence becomes. And so I think Virginia said it best early on with what is that consumer's preference going to be. So life, health, safety, the consumer confidence. And I also see one of the biggest changes will be the supply chain. The supply chain will dramatically change as it relates to even have enough drivers for the food service and hospitality industry or warehouse people, number of delivery days that we got spoiled of having five, six days a week. So I think we're going to see a, a lot of new norms out there. And those are just a few examples. Thank you, Dick. Charles, you were going to say something. Well, I was just, Pat, I was, it kind of goes back to your field um, uh, from your, from your accounting and, and uh, valuation days. Um, this is this seems like uh, 1993 in terms of um, <laughs> lenders and and um, investors um, attitudes about you know major hospitality in particular. I think the limited service uh, smaller stuff that Ken does is is probably going to be less affected. But in terms of getting a a new full service hotel off the ground uh, with construction lending and everything else, it's it's going to be shut down for a while. Um, most construction lending is going to be is going to be shut down for a while, and um, it's it's going to take a while to come back. the The restaurants, I could see the restaurants uh, coming back much more much more quickly, and and so I was very sorry to hear about the fifty five um, fifty five bars and restaurants that uh, John Zaputa was saying we're going to close. But I'm just ta talking about it from the standpoint of how. Uh, Wall Street and the money center lenders look at hospitality and uh, they're they're very uh, positive about Florida and Sarasota in particular but but it's um, this kind of um, a shock to the system is going to take a while to digest uh, that was my comment and right. thank you Charles we have about uh, two minutes left and uh, first of all I want to thank Elliot Falcione Elliot you, you really did a superb job with this today thank you and I also want to, I want to challenge all of us. The one thing we didn't talk about today was design, believe it or not. But you know what? I think design is going to be an issue when we reopen. Let's take a hotel, for example. What about people getting in elevators? What are they going to feel about that? I think, Dick, you made a, a very good comment that this ramp up on safety and sanitation is going to take some time. In restaurants, yeah, if we go and reopen, of course, people can't have face masks on while they're eating. So are we going to do, uh, are we going to do half the tables like we were doing before the, the main part of the virus struck? And if so, how are we going to generate the revenue we need during those hours? Maybe we're looking at different operating models where we might have part of the day, I'm just throwing this out, part of the day where uh, we, we, uh, we can serve more slowly and give them a, give them a nice experience that maybe a, a better value uh, proposition, as opposed to that time of the day when we really want to turn those tables over and get, uh, get, get them filled as, as well as with takeout. It's just, just some thoughts. And we're gonna have another seminar uh, in about another week and a half, two weeks. And we'll invite all of you to that, uh, maybe to be talking about more things like this. Now, what I'd like to do is thank the most important people here. And that's our students. I'd like everybody to unmute and to video. If you have a video, I want you to turn it on and unmute. Everybody start unmuting, unmute. And I want to give this, I want to give this panel, oh, good, look at you all, wonderful, smiling faces. Give everybody a big hand. Great job.
students, yeah. I will uh, I will be with you this week on uh, on Canvas. Our speaker next week was supposed to be Rick Benninghoven. I don't know. He's up to his neck in alligators right now. So I might have to prevail on one of these other people to uh, to come in and join us again next week. We'll see. But we'll have somebody for you, okay? Uh, and then uh, and then <coughs> that sort of concludes things for us for the semester. I'm your last speaker this year. Thank you, students. Thank you, panel. Thank you, Elliot Falcioni. Thank you, Jihan, for being our technical engineer today. Bye-bye. Bye bye. Thanks. Thank you. Cheers. Bye.